Hey, book lovers. My name is Em, and I want to talk about books. And cats. Hey, book lovers. Welcome back. It has been a busy reading week for me, really just the last couple of days. But that means I have two books to discuss this week. They are both mysteries, and they were both so satisfyingly written that I didn't even bother with guessing who done it the whole time. I knew they'd eventually tell me, and so I just sat back and enjoyed the ride. I feel like this kind of read is a real treat, and to have two of them back to back was pretty fantastic. I've had a pretty tough few days personally and also, you know, if you own a uterus and live in the United States, you're having a rough time right now. But a good read is always super soothing. If nothing else, it is an escape from the horrors of reality, right? (laughs) Uh, Listen, I want this show to be positive and fun and relaxing, but... I will just say that if you are somehow here and you are not a supporter of a woman's right to make decisions about her own body, move on, go away. There is no place for you here. Okay, anyway, back to books and cats, the fun stuff. Today I want to start with The House Across the Lake by Riley Sager. This book just came out on June 21st, the first day of summer. And first of all, I just love Riley Sager's books, which if you've been listening to the podcast, you already know. I told Andy that he's my new Stephen King. I have read all of his books, and I even pre-ordered this one to make sure I got it on the day it came out. That's pretty rare behavior for me. I'm not usually like so obsessed with a writer that I want the new one immediately. So yeah, fantastic. I also found that I cannot get the audiobooks because they are too slow. (laughs) I'm a pretty fast reader, and I devour Sager's books. I knew this one was going to be a one-sitting read and, barring a few breaks for family things, it was. And, as always, after inhaling one of these books, I'm bummed that it's over. Which shows the quality of his writing. I love a good mystery, and he does it so well. Plus, there is sometimes a somewhat paranormal aspect to the stories, and it adds even more possibilities and another sense of just instability, because you can't really predict what's going to happen at that point. Sager's also a big fan of the unreliable narrator. Uh, In this case, her name is Casey Fletcher. She's a disgraced actress who is in hiding at a lake house in Vermont. She's an alcoholic, and she's a young widow. She's also a complete mess, understandably. She has very good reasons. Her husband drowned at her family's lake house the year before, and so Casey turned to booze to forget everything. She also had a very public meltdown with paparazzi around, and her very famous mother forces her to go back to the lake house to try and get sober, and most importantly, stay out of the public eye. Casey, on the other hand, has no interest in getting sober. Her drinking is deliberate and copious. She knows exactly what she's doing. And honestly, if you had to go back to the place where your husband died only a year before, that's not a place to get sober. I don't see how anyone would have thought that was helpful. (laughs) Anyway, one morning, she sees something out in the lake and she realizes that someone's drowning. She rushes to the aid of a woman who has all but died in the middle of the lake, but she comes back to life as Casey is dragging her onto the boat. Casey brings her back to her house, which is directly across the lake from Casey's. It's a massive structure consisting of windows on the entire side of the house that is facing the lake, which anytime I see a house with, like, super huge windows, as nice as it must be and as nice as the views are, I always think, like, how are you cleaning those? But I guess if you have that much money, you're probably not doing your own windows, right? (laughs) Anyway, Catherine is a former supermodel turned philanthropist, and of course she is incredibly grateful for Casey saving her life. 
She goes and visits Casey a few times, uh, one time bringing her tech mogul husband, Tom, along with her. He's rather intense and also very hard to read. He seems nice enough, but Catherine drops a few hints during their conversations that make Casey believe that Catherine might be unhappy and having trouble in her marriage. Casey spends her evenings sitting on the back porch of the lake house in the dark with all the lights off and drinking herself into a cozy stupor. When the lights come on in the massive house across the lake, Casey grabs the high-powered binoculars her husband bought during a brief bird-watching phase, and she begins to spy on the rich, beautiful couple across the lake. It's easy at night when all the lights are on and they have nothing but windows. Yet another reason I question the window idea, but that's just me. <laughs> Casey quickly discovers the disharmony between Catherine and Tom. She spies them having an argument one evening, and the next day Catherine is gone and not answering her phone. Tom tells Casey that she went back to their apartment in New York City and is avoiding her. But Casey doesn't believe him. This book is so good. Just when you think you know the story, something else happens that makes you question a completely different avenue of possibility. And there are plenty of suspects other than Tom, including her other lake neighbors, Eli, an old family friend and an author who lives at the lake, and Boone, the handsome, sober ex-cop that is staying at the place next door. And like I said, Casey is a very unreliable narrator. She is always wasted, and she makes some very poor decisions. She can't be sure exactly what she has seen, and she has no proof. At least none that was obtained legally. I absolutely loved this book, and to top it all off, it's set on a lake in eastern Vermont. And the descriptions of the lakeside in Vermont are absolutely perfect. I'm a born and bred Vermonter, and I love the nature that surrounds me. And I am especially fond of lakes in Vermont. It really brought me back to a couple of summer vacations where we spent time in a cabin on Lake St. Catherine, western side of Vermont. <laughs> and I was just reading this book. I was just 100 percent back there. Honestly, Vermont is a perfect location for a mystery, and it was a perfect backdrop for this thrilling book. I highly recommend The House Across the Lake by Riley Sager and really anything that he's written. It is all fantastic. <laughs> Now it's time for a quick break, and then when I come back, I have another book to talk about, which also came out on the first day of summer. Be right back. Welcome back, book lovers. So like I said this week, I have a second book to discuss with you. And funnily enough, this one also came out on June 21st. And I've mentioned this one before, so you might recognize the title. I want to talk about The Drowning Sea by Sarah Stuart Taylor. Pretty recently, I did an interview with Sarah, and we talked a little bit about this book, but I hadn't read it yet, obviously. And it's just great. This is the third installment of the Maggie Darcy series, and I absolutely love this entire series. I love a good detective novel, and a badass, intelligent female detective is the absolute best. In this one, she is on vacation with her family in Ireland and staying in a cottage on a cliffside. Once again, the setting of this book makes me really want to go to Ireland. Her descriptions of the land and the coast are so incredible, and I would love to stay in those cottages. <laughs> Maggie is spending the summer there with her daughter Lily, her boyfriend Connor, and his son Adrian. They are kind of testing out life together as a family, and honestly, it's going pretty well. Maggie is not currently working, and she's kind of considering her options if she ends up moving to Ireland. It's becoming more and more tempting. Even Lily is enjoying herself. Maggie has been worried about her since her father passed, but a new place and some new faces really seem to be helping her, especially when she meets a handsome young musician named Alex and falls in love for the first time. While Maggie is trying to adjust to a more grown-up Lily, she is also drawn into a couple mysterious deaths on the cliffs, which seem to be more than just an accident. And on top of all of that, she also befriends the woman who owns the cottages and is drawn into investigating a mystery from the early 1970s that occurred in the big house on the peninsula and may or may not have involved a murder. It's all based on a memory from a woman who was only 10 at the time, so there's a lot of questions. 
There is a ton of mystery and intrigue in this little town, and the locals have tensions and disagreements that run deep and have been there for decades. I enjoyed every second of this book, and I highly recommend that you check out all three of the Maggie Darcy books by Sarah Stuart Taylor. They are so, so good. (laughs) So this week, I once again do not have a new chapter of Ocean Eyes, my weekly writing project. I have been writing here and there, And the next chapter is almost done, but not quite. There has been a lot going on in my life, and sometimes there just isn't the time or the energy to write. And it's just been one of those weeks. So I'm going to end this episode with a quote from a woman that I absolutely admire. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, AOC. The fact that she exists as a human being gives me hope for the future. So here's some advice from this brilliant woman. They'll tell you you're too loud, that you need to wait your turn and ask the right people for permission. Do it anyway. Stop asking and just do you, book lovers. Live with love in your heart and know how worthy and powerful you are, even if you're not feeling it right at this moment. And if you are a woman in the United States and you are currently in a state that no longer respects you as a full citizen, Keep in mind that Vermont's a really cool place to visit. Thanks so much for listening, book lovers. And until next time, keep reading.